Again, so it's a uh, plan today. We have uh, Dr. Eva Dinov just mentioned. He's going to talk after myself and the uh, questions and answers session. Uh, he is from the uh, MIDAS and the Computational Medicine and Informatics here at the University of Michigan. So one thing about the learning health system is a way to learn with the data uh, and, and the information that uh, after analysis, after using, we talked a lot about digital technology, but it's also, it's about people. It's also about research. It's about education and treatment. And how we integrate all these ecosystems is very important because from the data that we have in the lab, from the data that we have in the clinic, and even at the population level, that can help us uh, to uh, to help uh, in especially related uh, pain um, uh, in our society. So as a disclosure, I'm the co-creator of GeoPain, a technology that was uh, uh, developed here at the University of Michigan. We licensed from the University of Michigan through a startup spin-off uh, called Moxitech. One thing in, interesting about pain is that affects 100 million adults uh, in the United States. And we always think about moderate pain, but in fact, a third of uh, us so suffer with mild pain and almost un another third suffer with severe pain. About half of those 100 million patients have some kind of daily pain. And another misconception that we have is that it's not only affecting adults, but also elders. 50 to 80% of elders suffer with some kind of persistent pain in a nursing home. On the other side of the spectrum with the pediatric population, 20 to 46% of kids suffer some kind of persistent pain. So pain is something that is a life span problem and is one of the main reasons that we uh, look for uh, treatment or go to the healthcare profession. So how do you measure pain? So it, it although that is uh, the cost associated with pain is uh, immense for all governments and public, so we still measure pain, even develop uh, pharma and developing things to improve the care is after all this investment is from zero to 10. Zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain. And that's the way that we evaluate the fit, uh, how effective things are. So when we start to use it health, we can be much more precise about where the pain is, the intensity of the pain. This is one of example of technology that made available to patients for free, uh, where we collect data from patients that uh, have fibromyalgia. This is around 1,500 patients that we can uh, separate between clusters of female and male. And we can define uh, where the pain is and the heat maps so that we can be much more affected with the treatment. And this is not only in the clinical side, that information in a learning health system can also help education of our students. For example, in the pain courses at the dental school, one of the assignments is for students to go to the clinic, collect pain data from, from their patients, and we cluster the data, aggregate the data based on the diagnose. What we see here is pain of several patients with migraine, tension type of headache, temporal mandibular disorders, even an extraction and trigeminal neuralgia. So these are aggregate data. So in a learning health system environment that we can learn with the students and also de develop better treatments based on the data that our patients are giving to us. And we can create pain reports that are much more specific, not only related to pain, but also symptoms. And with that, we can do machine learning so that we can see how with the data that we have based on the heat maps, 
where, how we can classify a patient. If you put your pain where it is, can we be accurate to say you have this disorder or that disorder? This is very important, not only for migraine or fibromyalgia, that the, the diagnose is relatively straightforward, but also disorders and syndromes, uh, enlodenos, for example, uh, that we, uh, we, we need a large number of patients to create some consensus about the diagnosis. So that can provide that information back for the patient, not only to diagnose, but also to provide the best treatment for them. Again, it's data collected that uh, we use a statistical analysis to help those patients. Working with uh, uh, MIDAS uh, here at the University of Michigan, there are tools, technology tools, that we use the data to help in our research and potentially in the clinic. In, this, in the left side is CBDA, which is the compressive big data analysis, which rank the, the data from patients so that uh, can be uh, uh, then rank, for example, for collecting if you have migraine or TMD. So it's the, uh, the dermatome for the head or V1 or dermatome uh, uh, for the cervical area or it's tinnitus that you define if you have migraine or, uh, or TMD from the data from our patients. On the right side, it's an exploratory um, tool. So we put the data, what we see in blue is uh, uh, migraine patients, what we see in red, TMD patients without comorbidities. So, and then you can explore to see if they are clustering in different ways. If they are creating subgroups, maybe defined because of genetics, maybe because of a particular symptom or sign, and then how they respond respond to a particular treatment. So these are tools in artificial intelligence, machine learning that we can use to help uh, patients. The other thing too is how can we remotely help those patients, especially if they are in clinical trials or in the clinic. One of the studies here in the uh, periodontic uh, uh, clinic they have a clinical trial that they follow the patients after a surgery, a surgical procedure. So the patient takes, uh, they have their mobile and that information in the dashboard, the, the, the researcher can see if the pain is going up or down after the procedure and even create alert system that if the pain goes beyond seven, for example, severe, so that they can be alerted and also take care of the patient, contact them and see how you take the medication and also look at compliance if they are added information when uh, uh, needed. So in that, in the background has dermatomes. You can look at pain and analyze pain, not only for the full body, but the regions that you are responsible for. We are talking about the dentist, the, um, uh, the neurologist, uh, the uh, hand uh, specialist, for example, carpal tunnel. So they all can see if their treatment or procedures are being effective for that specific uh, 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 treatment. So as we connect with this health, and create this health environment, it's very important to, uh, one example is COVID-19, that Post COVID-19, many patients in the short term or the long term are having sever uh, uh, several symptoms and signs. Pain is one of the main ones, including headache. They are having fatigue and how to track them. So this is a collaboration uh, with uh, that we are setting up with uh, Dr. Ivo Dinov uh, from Midas but the leading uh, researcher is Dr. Uh, Allegri, uh, Massimo Allegri from the Italia Pain Group in collaboration with Rotary Club uh, of Bergamo City in Italy, which is one of the main affected regions in Italy. And the idea is to track those patients, use digital health 
to bring the information of pain symptoms and localize them. You see that you have more of a headache or you see that you have more of a visceral pain or joint pain, muscular pain. So that the way, and we talked about the challenges of uh, initiating those kind of uh, digital health studies. Another thing too is using biomarkers. So as we develop research, clinical research, translational research, is the idea of bringing information from genetics, from even the brain. And uh, so using machine learning to actually tell us if the patient has a migraine or not, and if it's severe, and if it's associated, for example, with activity of our endogenous opioids, our own painkillers. So we are studying patients with uh, uh, migraine and chronic migraine. And in fact, when they have the attack, they are released even more of endogenous opioids, peptides, which makes them not so effective if they take uh, opiates or medication. So that's a very important thing. But the other thing too, is using this uh, information for example, from the neurotransmitter in their, their brains with opioid and dopamine and tell us what are the targets in the brain by ranking that are the most important to classify them in a particular disorder. And that's one of the collaboration that we are having with Midas so that we are much more precise with the information and using biomarkers for something that is so subjective as pain. We are bringing this information to the clinic. Uh, we created the Michigan Clinic Augmented Reality Pain Unit so that we bring portable neuroimaging technology, for example, uh, FNIRS, Functional Knee Infrared, uh, infrared uh, Spectroscopy, which is optical imaging, light to see brain activation, and also some other technology like uh, neuromodulation, mobile application, virtual reality to debriefing, and even observational room so that we can use research in a learning health system approach to help patients. One thing that we are doing is combining clinical augmented reality, AR with artificial intelligence. How we do that? We use optical imaging to collect information from the patient, from their brains in real time. So here is a good example of something that we developed at the Hope Lab my, uh, and with the 3D Lab. And we use the HoloLens and create a, a software that sends the information from the brain of the patient in real time. So I'll be using the clinician. And what you see is the plotting of the patient's uh, brain uh, uh, a mark, but the, what you see in red and blue is real activation from the patient's brain, so in real time. So the other thing too, I, I, we had studies where we applied dental pain stimulus, uh, uh, patients with dental hypersensitivity, and we mix the data and we send back to the system. The algorithm is gonna tell if the patient is in pain and where the pain is, because we have a, a really precise map in the brain. So this is data collected in the past, but goes through the algorithm. So if you see that activation, the sensory cortex and frontal cortex, that image on the right side is tell, telling us if there is pain on the head and which side. So it's at the very beginning, but using data, uh, artificial intelligence, and augmented reality to making pain much more objective. So this is a, a, a little bit of a hint of how this, all this digital health and technologies can bring information, but most important is also to apply them in the research environment, clinical environment, and also education environment to help pain in our society. With that, I would say uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, if you have uh, any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Alex, hi, Lisa here. It looks like there's one question from Sharon in the chat. 
Um, I can read it and Sharon, if you'd like to unmute yourself and jump in, that's fine. But she's asking, how do clinicians track pain levels that are entered? Does the digital tracking app or tools talk tools talk with EMR systems like Epic? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. So uh, the this technology, they can send, uh, including Joe Payne, uh, can send reports to the doctor, uh, and it can send a message to the uh, vice versa to the patient. And the integration with the systems, health system, depend on the preparation for the data to be included in the health system. There are ways to do that, but there is a certain kind of uh, uh, preparation for the data to go straight, either by just uh, download as a PDF, the reports that you create, or just uh, seamlessly into the system. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Ron here, appreciate the response and a uh, very nice presentation. Um, I was also wondering when we're collecting. Hello. Sorry, when we're collecting uh, you know, patient data about pain, uh, I guess we're cueing patients uh, into thinking about their pain. Are there any modalities to track patients' function related to pain without cueing them to think about their pain? No, that's a good question because the pain is just part of that. It's very important for us to uh, look at the sensor sensory discriminative aspect of pain, meaning the uh, pain intensity, the pain area, but function uh, for example, if the pain affects your work, the pain affects your uh, school, uh, fatigue, sleep, those things need to be there in some way because uh, it is part of the suffering process of many of those patients. In fact, so the patients that have much more impact in their lives, the high impact chronic pain patients are the ones that are gonna need the most of treatment uh, in our uh, health system. So uh, it's not only pain, pain is part of that, collecting that data. Um, but we need that information to define where to target our treatments and uh, also to uh, match with other patients with probably the same disorder. Thank you. Thank you. So Alex, there are a couple more questions in here. Maybe you could take those and then we'll have uh, Evo start his presentation. Um, there's one from Margaret um, it, and she says, is this still in the research phase or is it being used in any pain clinics? It's already uh, in using research clinics, already using pharma. Uh, we have actually for free uh, across the United States and uh, users uh, outside. In March, we're gonna release the new one, still free, that can uh, help patients uh, and, uh, with much more of this AI and machine learning uh, support and help. And clinics, we are now uh, also uh, providing the support for uh, uh, connected health, yes. Okay, hey, um, we have uh, from Sarah, what sort of feedback have you received from patients about the use of this technology in medical practice? Is, is it positively received and have there been any ethical challenges? The ethical challenge is uh, for the, um, you know, when you provide healthcare, no matter what, the important and the one of our main concerns is to uh, uh, always with be HIPAA protected and protect the safety of the data for uh, the patients. And the, uh, the patients like it because they can uh, have control of the data and even the reports, how to send the time that they want to create a report, if they want to just think and zoom in the pain related to the head, or to the knee 
or to the visceral area, uh, uh, to the abdominal area. So these are important things that patients feel good. The clinicians like that. Is, uh, and one thing that we're trying to do is to make very well integrated and they have the ability even to telemedicine to have access to the data of the patient in 3D and uh, all that information during synchronous during the session, telemedicine session, but the reports before and after being able to actually monitor the patient outside the session, outside the hospital, so even getting alerts. So that is a beneficial uh, um, approach that for the clinician and also for the patient. Okay, great. Um, there's one more from Nancy, and then um, then we'll uh, have uh, have you introduce Evo. Uh, so Nancy's saying, what would be your rec recommendation in terms of priority populations that you think could have a large return on investment from a patient benefit perspective? For example, FQHCs and so forth. So uh, the the benefit of uh, 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 patients, especially uh, uh, patients that need a long-term treatment. So patients that even remote from the hospital, they don't need to come every time. So the doctor has good access to the way that they are uh, moving, the way that the pain, where the pain is, and having the alert when needed, when things are not proper. That can be done for one particular patient, but if you think as population of patients, let's say that you are a healthcare provider and you are dealing with uh, uh, 200 patients with migraine and that you are testing a particular medication, will them respond in the same way? You'll be a difference between male and females, will be a difference between pediatric population, uh, you know, the 3D bars that we have, also for different diverse group. You can see that. Uh, the way that are progressing and see it in a learning health system environment, if it, your treatments that you are providing are really helping, not the entire population of migraine patients that you, you are responsible for, but these diverse groups inside. So with that, I believe I would like to start um, the, with Dr. Ivo Dinov. He's a professor of computational medicine and bioinformatics in medical school, associate director of for education training at the Michigan Institute of Data Science in the Department of Health Behavior and Biological Science, vice chair of the Department of Health Behavior and Biological Science. The title is Data Identification and Clinical Decision Support. Sounds good. Thank you, Alex. A very uh, insightful presentation. Um, so just a quick thumbs up to make sure you can hear me okay, Alex. Uh, I know that I'm sharing the screen and the video should be working. So, yeah. Um, uh, okay, thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll spend a few words just to uh, give you my perspective on two uh, key elements of this notion of a learning health system and, um, and health informatics in general in an open science framework. So these two key, key issues are the data de-identification issue, and then the, the subsequent one is the clinical decision support. Thanks very much for joining. It's, it's a pleasure to, to be here. So I'm going to start off by uh, introducing something that may be perhaps clear for everyone, but it's nonetheless uh, probably useful to state explicitly what are the pillars of open science and why are they uh, important uh, for uh, current and future uh, scientific discoveries. So on the very top tier here, you, you can see the data, the metadata describing the data, study designs and so forth. The layer just below it includes anything from hardware to software to uh, analytical tools. Just below that, you have a layer of cloud services and multidisciplinary partnerships or collaborations. And then the bottom tier kind of represents, you know, the findings, the dissemination strategies, the sharing, the publications, the reporting, and so forth. And these are all key pillars of open science. Without them, you know, we wouldn't be where we are and our development prospectively would be significantly inhibited. 
So I'm going to uh, first talk about uh, data resources and analytical tools that I'm going to tell you about uh, various strategies for data de-identification. And then in the third tier, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly present about clinical decision support systems. So let's start at the very beginning. I want to describe the seven characteristics, what we define the seven characteristics of big biomedical and healthcare related data sets. These are important to realize because each of these rows represents one of these unique properties of what are the big biomedical data sets. And in the second column, I've simply outlined the challenges associated with each of these characteristics. So for example, you have size, that's why they're called big, and the corresponding challenges relate to uh, harnessing, managing a vast amounts of very uh, incongruent heterogeneous data sets, which is, believe it or not, not very trivial at all. On the second tier, you have the complexity of the data that requires addressing the challenge of wrangling, dealing with some of these data sets, you know, aggregating them perhaps, uh, and, and so forth. On the next, on the third level, you have the incongruency of the data, which basically leads to very strong need to develop services and tools that, are, that enable data harmonization and aggregation from multiple sources, because that's where the power comes up. Uh, you have uh, data that's very frequently multi-source. It comes from independent uh, uh, devices, uh, techniques, sites, places, experimentals, uh, conditions, and, and so forth. So, so these multi-source multi data sets, they need to be transferred, they need to jointly, holistically be modeled, and then um, they obviously need to be uh, analyzed uh, it, it, uh, as one computable data object as opposed to independent characteristics. Very oftentimes, some of these data is multi-scale, so you can be looking at macroscopic down to meso scale to micro scale and all the way down to the nano scale. In fact, you're looking at the same process, whether it's a nerve, whether it's a tissue type, whether it's an organ, you know, you, you, you can be looking uh, at different scales of the same process. These data are very frequently longitudinal in nature, and you need to be able to account for that longitudinal interdependence that's encoded in the data. And these data are never complete. So these are these are the, the seven dimensions of big data sets. And on the right-hand side, I simply pointed one, one example with a Parkinson's disease where we have typically thousands of individuals for which we have, just like Ali, Alex showed, uh, we have either optical imaging, we have uh, NMR uh, or, or MRI, depends upon where you're coming from. You have functional imaging, you have diffusion imaging, you have spectroscopy, you, you have all kinds of other imaging from which you can derive tens of thousands of biomarkers, right? And these are going to be fused together with the stuff that comes from the genetics, the stuff that comes from the clinical assessments, the stuff that, that, the stuff that people bring in in terms of their socioeconomic demographic uh, states and so forth. And they need to be holistically analyzed to find out the pattern. So for instance, we've done a number of studies where we look at, you know, can we predict which of the Parkinsonian patients are likely to fall in the next six months to have a physical fall because falls in the elderly are indeed uh, very difficult to deal with. So um, a little bit about the rationale of why is open science? You know, we talked about the core component, the, core the, the, the basic pillars, but I want to talk about why is open science uh, critical for us? And this has, you know, an, a number of people already brought up up, uh, up to this point, the notion of a return on investment, an ROI metric. So we are all familiar with the Moore's law that says that we expect our computational abilities to exponentially increase in about 18 to 24 months or a year and a half to two years, we double our computational power. What is less known is the fact that there is a counter positive argument to this called the Kreider's law that says that the volume of the data that we collect also doubles, in other words, increases exponentially. However, it increases exponentially much faster. It increases 14 to 18 months, it doubles. So this kind of tells you that we are acquiring more data than we can potentially uh, meaningfully interpret and interrogate to be able to make these predictions, to be able to make these forecasts, to be able to do these uh, clinical diagnostic uh, uh, probability estimates and so forth. So this basically says that we need novel methods. And I'm simply showing you here a trajectory of, of the Moore's law in green, and then you have in red, the genomics 
volume of data increase, as well as in blue, the neuroimaging volume of uh, data increase. So let's talk a little bit, you know, people probably are asking this question, well, you know, what are the sources of data? You know, where are these, why are they so complex? Uh, you know, uh, are they accessible? You know, are they shareable? You know, is there issues with security, privacy, regulatory uh, uh, discussions and so forth? And I I've simply outlined a few of the things that our group, the Statistics Online Computational Resource is using very heavily. Uh, from the UK, we have the UK Biobank, which is probably the, wor the world's largest archive of a census-like health-related um, uh, data gathering uh, that I'm familiar with. You know, th they have millions of patients that have voluntarily uh, uh, opted in that um, uh, uh, study. And uh, researchers like us that are outside of the UK or anywhere else sign data use agreement that basically says, yes, we're going to be good citizens. We're going to be using the data for the right purposes, right? We sign these agreements and then we get access to the data. So here are just some examples here uh, to show, you know, we are, for example, using half a million individuals for which we have over 4,000 clinical assessments. Um, about 20 to 30,000 of these individuals actually have brain MRI non-invasive structural functional and diffusion imaging. For each of these things, we can compute a variety of derived neuroimaging biomarkers, which we can correlate with the state of the individual, with their cognitive ability, with their disease um, phenotypes, uh, and so forth. Another one is what's called the MIMIC uh, PhysioNet, which comes from, from, uh, uh, from New England, a very, very powerful data set of uh, ICU uh, patients with uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of individuals, including structured and unstructured data elements, for example, clinical notes, which are notoriously difficult to deal with. We, part of the software resource, we have an open access to hundreds of data sets that, uh, that we have uh, collected over the, over the years, and they're all accessible for education research uh, purposes. And the National Institutes of Health provides uh, a number of resources uh, that also subscribe to the findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, the FAIR data principles, which are very important in science. Uh, in the second theory, if you recall, in my original diagram, I had shown you a few uh, tools um, that, that, that we're going to be using. So here are just some examples that we have developed uh, in, in the soccer lab at the University of Michigan. At the end, if there is time, I'll, I'll just very quickly uh, switch to a demo mode and show you some of these. We have uh, many, many dozens of web apps that can be used within a browser from any device, uh, machine, hardware independent, operating system independent. The only thing obviously you need to have is access to the internet because these are openly accessible resources. You don't have to authenticate, you don't have to log in, you don't have to share any information. You just go in, uh, start the app and just navigate. Many of the apps allow you to plug in your own data analyze it, visualize it, interrogate it, do forecasts, uh, and so forth. The second component is we have a very elaborate uh, resource, something called DSPA, which stands for Data Science and Predictive Analytics. This is a very large collection of open source tools that allow us to do a number of uh, quite interesting, for that matter, uh, analytical tasks. Now, these are R-based libraries. So to, to run these things hands-on, you will have to have the R statistical computing environment on your system or have access to some kind of a service that provides uh, R uh, computing services. Uh, but nonetheless, we have uh, case studies, we have snippets of code, we have end-to-end -end protocols embedded that show anything from uh, data import to data visualization to model-based inference to machine learning and artificial intelligence model-free uh, predictions, to uh, classification, regression, feature selection, uh, uh, you know, uh, deep learning, uh, uh, longitudinal analysis, optimization, a whole bunch of topics that, that you can see kind of a snippet of here on, on the site. And the last category, the large category of tools that we have developed is something called space time analytics where we are complexifying the notion of time, we're lifting the longitudinal order of events from the positive reals 
into the complex plane. And when you do that transformation, some really, really interesting things emerge that allow you to have uh, uh, really innovative strategies to squeeze in information and derive knowledge from longitudinal data sets. So um, in the second half, uh, I'll, let me just sp spend a little bit of time on the notion of data de-identification, right? It is important there is a number of regulations here in the United States, for example, there is something called HIPAA, FERPA, and various other federal regulations that require appropriate guardianship, appropriate management, uh, uh, secure storing, uh, appropriate, uh, obviously, processing of, of data and so forth. And as you can see, uh, just like I pointed out early on, there is, just when you're talking about the human brain, for example, there is probably uncountably many ways in which you can reconstruct a three-dimensional representation of brain anatomy, physiology, and function. So these are just some exemplars of these that include both functional imaging, structural imaging, and so forth. Now, one of the important things that I mentioned earlier is the fact of return on investment. And it is important to realize here that um, at the moment at which the data acquisition stops, the value of the data exponentially decreases. So anybody who is hoarding data can look at this diagram that I have here on the right-hand side and simply see precisely how much of the value that's contained in these data objects uh, diminishes as we um, as we uh, go forward with uh, hoarding the data without sharing. So the return on investment could obviously be amplified by us openly sharing so that others can learn, others can aggregate, others can infer, others can model the data uh, for the appropriate needs. So in the data sifter technology, what we're interested in is the notion of security versus utility, right? So protection and privacy, versus energy, ut energy, utility, and value of the data set. These things are typically in a very delicate balance that we are trying to optimize. And uh, well, one of our students, Nino Zhu here, just um, uh, is publishing right now a, a paper that, that, that's in review that kind of argues that we can precisely model with the data sifter how much is being gained in terms of risk reduction of the identification by statistically obfuscating the data, how much is being gained and how much we have to give up in terms of the utility of the data for different levels of statistical obfuscation throughout the continuum, from no obfuscation all the way up to synthetic data generation. So uh, very briefly in, in the last uh, five minutes or so, there are techniques already out there. One is called absolute differential privacy, and another one is called fully homomorphic um, uh, encryption. We have developed a, a data sifter method which does iterative statistical uh, 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 obfuscation on the data. And I'll just show you one, one example here um, that, that kind of uh, demonstrates the notion of how is this thing used in practice. So imagine you have two users, Jane and Joe. They're domain experts. They have nothing to do with the health system. They are just researchers interested in solving a problem, okay? So they have some queries. They specify any data of this type, these characteristics, that size, uh, and all these things. They send it to an, uh, a data governor, somebody who actually has data, like what they have. These data queries are converted to the uh, uh, SQL language or now no SQL language. They're, they're, uh, the database is being queried and, and some data is being extracted. So then we go through the data sifter process in a number of iterative steps where here is the um, most important parameter that allows us to control this, to navigate that range of possibilities between no obfuscation all the way up to completely synthetic data generation. And this iterative process, we do a number of statistical perturbations, step after step after step, in such a way that we preserve the joint distribution of the data at every one of these iterations. At the end, we generate a nice, congruent, homologous, complete data set that's shared by the data governor with the users. And I'll mind you, this data that's shared is different from the ones that's actually in the database. 
it's statistically obfuscated. There is zero reason for people to hide behind um, uh, uh, HIPAA and FERPA regulations to share in the data. There is zero reasons behind that. There are mechanisms that allow you to perturb the data to the point where it is not essentially human subject data. It's derived, it samples from a human subject distribution, but it's not really observed human data. It's sent to the corresponding users, they do their magic, and then they generate, in this specific case, human brain maps. That's how the, the data sifter is used. And finally, you know, this notion of uh, clinical decision support. So I'm gonna show you that these, the notes, by the way, are going to be shared with everyone. So you will have access to all these resources. My personal philosophy is if it's not online and openly accessible, it doesn't exist. So everything that I'm showing you here is completely accessible to anywhere, uh, uh, to anyone across the globe, uh, as long as they have obviously access to uh, the internet. So um, uh, space time service is this notion that I mentioned a second ago of actually transforming time courses or time series data into complex time or time surfaces is very interesting because instead of looking now at line lines or projections, we're looking at surfaces which have interesting topology, geometry, curvature, and so forth that can be exploited to find out precisely what this process has in terms of its affinities, in terms of its relation to the outcomes, in terms of how it can be modeled, you know, how does it allow prediction and so forth. Um, again, uh, the notion of open science, web services, GitHub repositories for, for code, sharing the projects and sharing the apps. So this is my group, uh, obviously, you know, uh, the secret sauce is uh, here at the University of Michigan we've realized for a number of years is team science and uh, you know engagement, deep engagement of students into research projects. So a little bit of the funding, number of students and teams that are participating in the project. And um, before I uh, go up to the to questions, uh, Lisa and Alex, do I have a, just a minute maybe to show some of these uh, examples that I mentioned? Sure. Do we need to stop? Well, yeah, no, you can, as far as I'm okay. concerned, you can go ahead. We don't have any questions yet in the chat, so feel free to okay. enter those, uh, anybody. Sounds go good. Ahead. So let, let me just show a few examples here. These, these are all links that were included, by the way, in the slides, and you can uh, Google search. My slides are already on the website. You, you can find them. So here, here is one example that has a whole bunch of things. Now, by the way, there is a PubMed navigator. If, if you want to search PubMed, um, uh, by keywords, but graphically, you just type in an investigator or something and, and you can actually search for uh, Alex da Silva. Uh, right up here, it searches the database. You're gonna find Alex, you're gonna find all of his uh, collaborators and all the all the da Silva's out there because Alex is certainly not the only da Silva, but he, here is he and, and you can double click on this and, and actually go, go to uh, put him in the center and see all, all the uh, network of his collaborators and so forth. So instead of doing keyword field-based search, you can do graphical search. Here is another very interesting app that allows you to do up to seven dimensional data in a 2D, uh, in, in, in a 2D uh, uh, timeline course, right? So here's a motion chart where you can load in your data. In this case, this is a very simple data. It's got one longitudinal dimension time and a whole bunch of other characteristics. And then you can map each of these characteristics right up here, you can map each of these characteristics to various uh, appearance of these charts, right? What is the key? What is the longitudinal variable? What's mapped on the X axis? What's mapped on the Y axis? What is the size of the blob? What's the color of the blob? What's the category? So all these things you can map and you can see, you can tag some of these objects and see, this is a very simple housing pricing index that kind of shows you, for example, unemployment rate on the top, on the very bottom, you have uh, the housing price index. So if the housing price index is increasing, is increasing and the unemployment rate is increasing, you know that you have a huge problem. You know? So this kind of hits you right in the face of how you can model these things. You can find the bigger states, the smaller states, find the relation, which states are heading where, and you can do data interrogation this way. Here is the example of the DSPA materials that I mentioned. They include a whole bunch of other things, including deep learning. Uh, there is a whole bunch of appendices and so forth. Uh, just to show one of these examples, you have R code, assignments, you have videos, 
of learning modules. Every one of these things has a table of contents. You can go to any of these uh, uh, specific results, look at the exact R code, look at the exact uh, outcomes that, that, that come from this, all the math is described for those of you that are mathematically inclined. So this is a, this is a very large collection, especially for underprivileged communities to learn advanced analytics in a completely open science framework. Um, here is a little bit of the uh, spy, uh, space time uh, uh, method that I mentioned a second ago. I'll just show you some of these little animations here. So this is a nice animation because it shows you the time series. The time series that we are all accustomed to using are just projections of these time surfaces. As you can see, the red and the blue curve here, these are uh, analytical representations of time series, but the red and the blue, they don't have any connection to themselves when they're parts of a common time or complex time surface, obviously the curvature of the surface, the geometry, does the surface have holes? You know, how rapid the change along the, sur the different directions on the surface are. So these provide you with additional information that may lead to quite interesting uh, predictions. Here is one uh, other example that allows you to do, for example, interactive pressure injury, injury prediction. You know, who is going who's likely to develop an ulcer in the hospital? So right up here, you can see dynamic charts of what are the key elements that kind of drive, drive the notion of classifying people that are likely to have uh, 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 odds, high odds of developing pressure injuries when they're immobilized in hospital settings. And for every case, obviously here you can see the probability. So this specific person has 73.6% probability of developed pressure injury. The next person has 0%. So imagine somebody comes in the hospital, we have acquired all of these data in advance, we can just plug it in here, you can enter it by hand and click predict, and it's gonna give you an estimate. An estimate for the probability, this is using obviously, um, uh, you know, machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, to, to model previous data sets and so forth. We have another example of a, a very powerful thing that Alex alluded to a little bit earlier. So in this case, about 10,000 individual brains. You can see 9,914 uh, 9, uh, uh, participants, uh, 208 different dimensions being projected in three dimensions. And you see magically the red brains, which are labeled two, are distinct. They're kind of clustered separately from the one brains, which are kind of uh, purple, right? And, and you, 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 can, you can navigate this. You can do, if you're, if you're so inclined, do the PCA, and the, the PCA, you know, might also be able to uh, represent the two groups slightly differently, as you can see. But you can interrogate this 208-dimensional data set down into three dimensions where you can do the exploratory uh, analytics. So that's probably a good place for me to stop and see if there are any questions that I might be able to answer. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Igor. Uh, very fascinating, the possibilities we have uh, for data analysis. There is a comment from uh, there was a comment from Bernardo Mariano uh, when uh, about the learning health systems and uh, and machine learning and artificial intelligence actually, and uh, it's not that it is a static um, tool. I mean they they grow, they develop, they give you algorithms, and actually they learn with the process. Is there uh, on your view as is, uh, in statistics? Is there a way that we can regulate the development and growth of these machine learning, artificial intelligence tools that we see, and how that could be better regulated or supervised? Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I hope that my supervised word is not being taken a different way, but. No, you, you're, right. you're asking the right question. This is the million dollar question, Alex, and it integrates quite closely with, with, with the notion of, um, uh, AI ethics, right? Because you, you can set you can set some kind of a machine uh, to learn on its own and do on its own, and you know uh, you know pollute the space of knowledge out there. So it is a very tricky business. Uh, but at the same time, regulations are also not easy to do simply because number one, you don't want to stifle innovation. Number two, you don't. There are some known unknowns and there are some unknown unknowns, right? So it's a very delicate balance between how to lightly 
regulate or, 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 or instead of regulating, um, guide the development of artificial intelligence to the extent at which you minimize the risk of going awry, you know, with, with some of these techniques. So for example, we're all familiar how, for example, if, if you have, if you train a machine learner to recognize faces, uh, darker skin faces tend to be more difficult to re-identify. And obviously that leads to higher chance of erroneous discoveries if you set up the system to work throughout, uh, th throughout the community, right? So, so, so there's a lot of hidden potential biases. Every time with machine learning, there is this notion that the more you train on something, the better you become at it. But most of the time we're looking for these white swans. We're looking for the, uh, you know, for the black elephants, right? We're looking for the extremely unlikely events. And extremely unlikely events are not very commonly observed. So we can't really, it's difficult to train on them, right? So, but uh, believe me, the scientific community is trying very, very hard uh, to do that balance. Um, and obviously progress is being made. It's not perfect. There are problems, challenges, uh, if you wish, abuses perhaps. Uh, but you're absolutely right. The dialogue has started and where it leads I don't think there will be a, a state in which we're gonna declare a success. It's gonna be a, a constant tuning, a constant adjustment, a constant human machine retraining and interaction that will probably drive that process. Thank you very much, Ivo. So I believe that now we've come to the end of our uh, breakout session, a lot of, about pay and also a lot about uh, uh, machine learning and new tools in statistics. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for the attendance and feel free, please, to send emails uh, to Dr. Eva Dinov or myself uh, for the questions that I'm able to uh, answer uh, and also to uh, anything that we can help. Thank you very much, you all. Have an amazing day.